Greetings, everyone. This is the Hipster Snick. And today, we're going to do another Snick Flicks, which I haven't done in a while. Today, we're going to be talking about Sonic Prime, the new Netflix series. So, before I get started, let's just clear the air of something first. Sonic the Hedgehog fans are passionate. They either love or hate everything involved with the franchise, rarely with any middle ground whatsoever. And to be honest, I think this is one of those rare times. I'm completely lukewarm, and there's a lot to get into, so we're just going to dive on in head first, starting with something that isn't actually in the show, but something I noticed while looking over the Twitter feed relating to this show. The creators of the show were trying to claim that this is Sega Sonic canon. No, it isn't. No, no, just no, no, it's not. It absolutely isn't. And if it is, it makes the canon worse. So let's start with the obvious. No animated series has ever been canon. Not even Sonic X, which was one, Japanese, and two, adapted content straight from several games, including Sonic Adventure, Sonic Adventure 2, and Sonic Battle, of all choices. But yeah, no, this isn't canon. It absolutely is not canon. And I'll explain more as we go. So we can just jump straight into episode one here. Episode one establishes the status quo, and it's Sonic, Tails, Knuckles, Amy, and Rouge the Bat for some reason. I guess they really like that five-man band thing that Sonic Boom had going for it, but they didn't want to include Styx the Badger, who is Sega Sonic canon, weirdly enough. <laughs> if you know, you know. If you don't know, um, you'll find out. Anyway. Uh, the entire episode starts with Eggman hatching some nefarious scheme. Sonic's not really 100% sure what's happening. And of course, because Sonic has to channel Barry Allen, he's late to the fight. And of course, you kind of see the different character personalities as they're in this fight. And they do a good job because like a whole bunch of the enemy minions working under Eggman are indeed uh, things like the Caterkillers or Crab Meat. Enemies from Sonic games that we know and love. So I, I do like the, the nod to some of the games. And right away, we're introduced to the Deus Ex Machina slash MacGuffin of the series, the Paradox Prism, which is a magic stone of great but untold ability, which Eggman wants. And, like, of course he does. Like, nothing about this is uh, particularly new or groundbreaking. And Sonic just breaks it just like smashes into it the instant Eggman gets close to it. And here's one of those reasons why I don't believe the series is indeed Sega Sonic canon. Because this scene is incredibly stupid because it's almost a complete recreation of the scene from Sonic Lost World where Sonic breaks the horn that seals the Zeddy. Yeah, this is like almost identical in every respect. It's Sonic going against what everyone else is saying and just rushing in and smashing a really important plot item. And if this is Sega Sonic canon, that means Sonic Lost Worlds already happened, which would mean Sonic learned literally nothing from that game. And the entire point of the story in Lost World was Sonic taking time to think through his actions rather than just acting on them. So if this is supposedly canon by Sega standards, it makes the canon worse. And I'll get back to that in a minute. So stick a pen in that. We're not done there yet. And here's a weird thing that the eight existing episodes of this series do. Almost every single one of them flashes back to this fight again. And they slightly expand on the fight scene by like seconds at a time instead of just having it all be in episode one like it should have been. And it creates a lot of pacing issues in a season that already has a lot of those. Because what happens next is Sonic breaks the Paradox Prism, which shatters reality. And it causes this whole multiverse of madness shenanigans, and the pieces are thrown into different worlds, and Sonic is thrust into this new place called New York City. Very, very clever, very original. Cough, cough. And the whole thing is this dystopian future where there's this council of Eggman clones who rule over the city as a thing called the Chaos Council. And no one knows who Sonic is. The one recurring factor in each of these worlds he visits is that Sonic 
was never there. He was never a factor, and no one knows who he is. So right away, we get this city that feels like Sonic Forces fan fiction, because there's a lot of heavy emphasis on this. Like New York City and the Eggman Council are the biggest plot point in everything that happens. And there's like three different worlds we see over the course of these episodes, and I'll get to those in a second. The whole thing is the battle for the Paradox Prism, but most of the episode's time is Sonic meeting these different counterparts to all his friends who, for some reason, they felt the need to give them different names in each world because that's totally necessary. And it's all just hinged on, hey, we're friends, Sonic will say. And then the counterpart to one of his friends will be like, no, we weren't. And this happens a lot, like way more than it should have been allowed to happen. Like this, this happens entirely too often. And it creates large lulls in what should have been moments of character development. Uh, I know they may have felt they couldn't contrive reasons to just trust this blue stranger out of nowhere, but in other scenes, they do anyway. So, shrug. Anyway, while at the city, Sonic goes around, and the, the, one of the things that ends up becoming a little bit of an issue is the show's comedy is mostly Sonic runs into something or Sonic falls, or is knocked down. That's most of the slapstick in the show. And the early episodes go really heavy on it, because Sonic is somehow charged with power from the Paradox Prism, because, I don't know, hedgehogs are like weird magnets for magical energy in this universe. And he kind of slips and slides until he uh, tails his counterpart from New York City, creates this modification to his gloves and shoes, which kind of acts as a recurring deus ex machina. Because in each world, they get different forms and different side abilities, which is mostly just very, very convenient powers that just kind of sidestep issues the writers would have to work around otherwise. It's a little transparent at spots. There are times where it's genuinely clever, but I'll cover that more in a second. Sonic ends up meeting Nine, I believe he was called, because oh, he made mechanical tails for himself, which is basically just the Iron Spider suit from Marvel. Um, Tails is like edgy and emo and um, yeah there was one bit I liked though Tails' workshop passcode is 1992 which is the year Sonic the Hedgehog 2 debuted and I was like okay that's that's very cute I liked that and later on um, they give citizen ID numbers to the people in this dystopian city and Big the Cats was 1998 which is the Japanese release date for Sonic Adventure and I'm like you know what Someone took some time to research some of this stuff. I like that. That was genuinely clever. Um, I like that a lot. And yes, Big the Cat is in this. He's actually a little more prominent than I thought he would be, which is cool because I love Big the Cat and unironically. <laughs> and I was just really happy to see him get to do something and kind of interact with everyone. So eventually he teams up with the Rebels because, again, Sonic Forces. And he ends up meeting this Eggman Council. Most of them are pretty much one note. Like, there's a baby. His joke is he's a baby, but he's also, like, the sadist. But, like, no one really understands what he's saying because he speaks just gibberish. Then there's the pretty boy Eggman who has, like, samurai armor. He's kind of a weeaboo, but he's also, like, a romantic and a poet. Then there's the, like, angsty teenager who's always playing something that looks very much like a Nintendo Switch the entire time. And then there's, like, the old man, and, and his joke is, he's old, guys. Like, that's literally the one joke he ever gets to do, and so, like, it's the entirety of his character. Then there's, like, Mr. Dr. Eggman, which is just Eggman wearing a wig and doesn't know who Sonic is. It's completely superfluous, and it feels very much like one of those old fan fictions. You can tell how old I am, because I don't even know if this is a common trend in fan fiction anymore, where a character will get killed off, and then it's, like, replaced by some O.C., but the OC is basically just that character again, but dumber. That's what this is. <laughs> and that's, that's the main villain. Like, we have to deal with these guys the entire time, because even when they're not on screen, their presence is still felt, because the whole thing is the rush for the shards of the Paradox Prism. So Sonic competes with them for a little bit, and ultimately gets the shard and gets warped into a jungle world. The jungle world was probably my favorite bit, because I felt it was actually the one that was the most poignant. And the whole thing is, in this world, the people live up in these high treetop canopy wooden villages that they've had to create to stay off the jungle floor because there's a monster. A monster prowls the jungle floor. And it turns out the monster is Amy, who went nuts because she felt like the others weren't respecting the jungle 
And we're, we're taking advantage of it and kind of pillaging it without ever giving anything back. So she went nuts and exiled them as violently as possible. And there's actually some really good slapstick because she like hits them so hard, they like fly up to the canopy level. It's actually really done. There was a lot, a lot of uh, really good kinetic energy in, in those scenes. In fact, that's another thing I have to, to praise the show for is the action sequences are really well done. Like there's a lot of movement. There's, there's weight behind the characters' movements. It gives it kind of that, it's still cartoony, but it gives it a little more realism. Like they actually have a physical presence in the world they're in. And I like that the camera is very dynamic. It doesn't just sit still. The camera itself is actively moving around like it's a participant in the action sequences, and it works to the show's overall benefit. And I think the jungle episodes, which I think there's only like two of them, uh, really benefits from that. And they take advantage of the, the camera being way, way, way zoomed out. And the Sonic is kind of small on screen, but it gives you the sense of how huge and overwhelming this jungle is. And I think it's, it's probably my, my favorite designed a bit of the show, to be honest. Now, at the same time, there are a lot of shortcuts being used. You'll see kind of some asset reuse, especially when Sonic does the figure eight dash. I know that was a big thing in Sonic CD and a lot of people love it. In this show, it looks super lazy. Like they just kind of put a Mobius strip underneath his body and his legs disappear. And then they kind of like texture it to make it look like it's moving. But it, it looks super lazy. Like I think the Sonic Boomcast like did a better job animating Sonic's run cycle than doing this. Like I really, really just do not like how this comes out looking. And they try to stylize it a little by having it be different color depending on which world he's in. It still looks bad. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. And the let's talk about the jungle. <laughs> let's shift to the stuff I like. Good stuff now. Sonic arrives and is very put off because he just got done kind of relearning everyone in New York City. So he runs into them again in this world, and they, they don't recognize him. So he ha- kind of has to go through the same trials again. Afterwards, when he's like, oh, okay, you guys were attacking me because you misunderstood, and you guys need help getting to the jungle floor because there's a monster down there. So yeah, I'll help. I can fight monsters. I, I do that sort of thing all the time. So they go down, and when Sonic realizes it's Amy in a giant flicky, like, He's like, no, no, like we, we can be friends. And Sonic tries to genuinely insist. He's like, we should talk through our problems and try to get to the heart of the matter. And there's like this, this flashback. And here's the thing. Okay, I have to go back into the negative, I guess. Prime focuses a lot on Sonic having horrendously poor social skills and incredibly dysfunctional friendships. And he ignores Tails. He harasses Knuckles like way more than he does anywhere else. And basically kind of ignores Amy and Rouge overall. And, and again, I still think it's really weird that Rouge is a main, but whatever. They didn't have the heart to commit to best girl, I understand. But like, here's the thing. They're claiming this show is Sega Sonic canon. And it had the really unfortunate timing to come out at the time of Sonic Frontiers, which in all ways portrays precisely the opposite. And they're trying to say it's canon because there's two token references to Sonic Origins. I'm sorry, but you already contradicted literally everything else. And they're still trying to play Sonic for comedy, but like you're trying to have this heartfelt moment where he's talking to Amy and trying to be like, oh, well, this is what my Amy would have done. And they make this really awkward, overly long gag where he starts hand puppeting the characters speaking to one another. And Oh my God, it's cringe. Like, there's no other word for it. It's bad. But then, like, when they get past that and they have this moment where, where the jungle of Rouge and the jungle Amy are talking, and Sonic is like, Yeah, yeah, like, talk this out. Like, actually say what you mean. What happened? What did you see? What did you see? And there's actually like this genuine moment of, of heartfelt sincerity that's nowhere else in the show. And I think it's for this reason the jungle is my favorite bit because. Even though it's very laughy, zany, jokey, wacky, Sonic losing fights, like they get to this moment that that has some real weight behind it. And it reminds Sonic, he's like, gosh, I I shouldn't take my friends for granted. Again, something he doesn't do in canon. But I mean, in the sake of the show, it makes sense and it works out. And I think that actually makes those two episodes my favorite of the entire thing, because the instant he gets the next shard, he's back in New York City again. Later, he ends up going to a pirate world which is actually where the series just stops. Like, it doesn't really end. There is no ending right now. It just stops mid-story beat. And, like, Knuckles is a pirate captain who ended up losing his ship and his original crew 
So basically, the Sonic's other friends are just other characters like Amy, Tails, and Rouge, and Big, who are still hanging around in the events afterward, while the rest of the crew, who are mostly just like generic furry characters like Sonic Forces, just having left and are now led by Jack Jacksepticeye. Very cute cameo, very pointless cameo. Now let's talk about the thing that I really didn't want to talk about, which is why I've waited 15 minutes to do it, and that's the voice cast. Okay, starting with the good, Rouge and Amy sound fine. Tails' new voice is pretty good. I actually liked his. Uh, Eggman's voice actor is basically doing a Mike Pollock impression, but according to Mike Pollock on his Twitter feed, he was just doing a Dean Bristow impression, so maybe that's just on brand. And that's all the nice things I have to say. I just don't like Sonic's new voice. It's not clicking no matter how much I watch. Knuckles is way too deep. Shadow sounds fine when he's speaking calmly, but when he starts trying to scream, his voice cracks. And yeah, Shadow's in this, but he literally just shows up to harass Sonic for no reason, and that literally goes nowhere. He might as well not even be in the show since he just slows things down. In fact, they might have been money ahead to swap Knuckles and Shadow's voice actors. That might have worked better. And despite getting only one line each, Orbot and Cubot sound bad, and it's just wrong and bad and off, and it never gets better. I kept thinking that the voices would grow on me, but they absolutely don't. And it's something I hate to say, because again, I love these characters and I want to give new voice actors the benefit of the doubt. I've always tried to do that from the four kids iteration to Roger Craig Smith. I just do not care for this voice cast very much. Some of them are good, but no one's a standout. And that's really disappointing, especially for a show that has no theme song. There's very little musically happening here. There's some decent action tracks, but they're very forgettable. It feels like the audio was the thing that they skimped on, and that's really unfortunate, especially since I already had my beast with the visual side of things. For example, while the backgrounds look really cool, the only place where the environment is really taken in as a factor is the jungle area, because on the pirate ship, you have the deck, and that's it. In New York City, You have all these cool buildings and stuff, and there's some good scenes of Sonic like running up and down skyscrapers, but he never really uses it to his advantage. It's just something to do that looks visually more stimulating than him running down a road. And I feel like they could have done a lot more with it, but the biggest struggles are identity and pacing. And by that, I mean, it feels like this was made by someone who was dissatisfied with how short Sonic Forces was. The comedic bits reminded me a bit of Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog because it's mostly slapstick. Some of the jokes stuck, certainly, but it wasn't like a belly laugh. It was a, heh, <laughs> that was pretty good. The Eggman Council are basically the Zeddy from Sonic Lost World again, except they didn't have a female, and that just feels super uninteresting. The only ones with any real personality to speak of are the just Eggman again, and that artsy-fartsy one I mentioned with the samurai armor. The others are just one notes or their memes. This entire multiversal what-if setup feels really off-brand and incredibly superfluous. It feels like they're just trying to do what Marvel movies are doing and just trying to ride on their coattails, and I feel that's a shame because the idea of a multiversal Sonic opens up tons of possibilities that are way more creative than they're using to its full advantage. It just feels lacking. That's not to say that I don't hope for its success, because as I said, there are aspects that work. They're just crowded by a lot that don't. If they want the series to persist, here's some stuff that could help greatly. First, trim a lot of the fat. Focus on the forces like story in New York City and develop it. It's clearly the one you like the most. Everything like the pirates is fluff and filler, so stop trying to rely on it. Have the heroes make some kind of decisive win at some point, because the narrative flow has been stuck in neutral for entirely too long. There's a lot of just losing fights and trying to be quippy, but That's not your sense of humor, and it shows. Also, Rusty Robot Amy is not as interesting as you seem to think she is, so I don't get your obsession with her. Please stop trying to make her like this main focus of the story. Honestly, the show is overall painfully mediocre. It's very okay, but one, it's not canon. And two, it's really not great. Unless they pull a hard U-turn and finish the story out, really strong or maybe in an unpredictable way, this is going to end up in the recycling bin alongside Sonic Underground and the nobody bothers to remember that this even exists category of Sonic media. I wanted to like this. I wanted to support it, but I can't. 
There's a good show trapped in there somewhere, but it's going to take more than Sonic spin dashing into the rock to unearth it. And I hope they can pull it off. It'd be great if they could. I'd like to see this do well, but it's going to take a major course correction to do that now. It would take a lot to get me interested in a part two. This has been the Hipster Snick, and thank you for joining me on today's episode of Snickflix. If you haven't already, why not hit the subscribe button and follow for more? There's more like this each week with reviews, Let's Play, Snack Tech, and more, and the new home of the Tomodachi Bros Review Podcast, where we're going to do all sorts of great stuff, including Season 2 extras, and maybe an entirely new format for Season 3. Hint, hint. Hit like if you haven't already, or us dislike if you disliked it, because you're free to do that. But this is the Hipster Snack, and I'll see you next time.